Avengers Endgame did a save the world story where everything and everyone for all of time is at stake really, really well. So let's talk about why. Spoilers ahead for Endgame, obviously. If you haven't seen the film, don't watch the video. So remember when Sony dropped the trailer for Spider-Man Far From Home and everyone was just like, ha, huh, well, I uh, guess he comes back in Endgame then. Sort of took away the big question that uh, everyone thought they were gonna focus on. That, uh, yep, they would indeed save the world. Yet, here's the thing. Endgame still managed to build and sustain tension very effectively. So, the question becomes, how did that... Can, can you hear that? What is that sound? Oh hey, it's Red and Blue from Overly Sarcastic Productions. You know, I thought Thanos dusted you. You'd think so, but Thanos really wasn't being specific enough with his definition of life and... We're just cartoon characters, so we're fine. And we know a little bit about this whole saving the world thing, too. Oh, well, that's, uh, marvelous. Ha, 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 ha. So, um, why don't you tell us about what the problems are with the save the world trope? Creating tension means establishing stakes, and this can be incredibly tricky to do. Super low stakes are uninteresting to begin with, but if we set the bar too high, it becomes impossible to stay invested. We all know in the back of our minds that the bad guys can't just win, since that would be incredibly unsatisfying. So let's talk about Infinity War. How do you establish that your antagonist means business? You have him beat the crap out of the entire cast of Thor Ragnarok, mostly off screen, like it's nothing. That way when Banner falls into the sanctum panting that the audience immediately knows what this dude is capable of. Over the course of the movie, the tension ratchets further and further up as Thanos collects more stones, getting more and more powerful until and then it's the worst case scenario come to pass. The bad guy won. That is an extremely bold filmmaking choice because it hits us hard with the most important component of stakes, consequences. As much as people like to complain about comic book movies not having any consequences, there are several films in the MCU that are directly incited by the events of previous movies. And of course, the biggest one of them all is the snap. So now, Endgame starts in a fascinating space. The heroes have lost. This is completely uncharted territory for superhero movies, as the entire first hour of the film stews in the deep consequences of that substantial, catastrophic failure. It doesn't start any more in media res than Endgame. But the trouble is that, from the outset, tension is minimal because there's no way things can get worse for the universe. From a strictly narrative standpoint, there's nowhere to go but up. So on paper, there are really no stakes at all. It's tricky enough to manage stakes in a save the world story, but this is an unscrew the world story, so it's completely different territory. Then how did the writers take a situation that begins in an incredibly dark and futile place and turn that into two and a half hours of more tension? Well, the writers actually did something pretty simple. For the most part, the tension and the emotional weight in the narrative isn't actually derived from the save the world story threat, where they need to bring all the people back and save the world and or universe. Instead, it's derived from two things. One, who will die, and two, internal character struggles. This was a really good decision on part of the writers, because these are things that people actually deeply and truly care about, that they can relate to, that they get invested in, and that they cannot predict, unlike whether or not they will save the world, meaning they can use them to ramp up the tension and stakes more effectively. For a closer look, let's examine the obstacles the characters face in each of the three acts. The challenges of the first act are bringing the Avengers back together and then whipping up some time travel, and it ends with Cap's obligatory pep talk and them jumping back in time. You would think that the tension would be directly derived from the difficulties in inventing time travel, and while I'm no expert, I'm pretty sure it's a difficult thing to do, but no. Tony Stark manages to invent time travel virtually the first time he tries in a single scene. There isn't the struggle we would usually associate with such a major obstacle to saving the world. We see him play with some holograms, there's a brief clip of one simulated failure, which we didn't see him invest any time or effort into, before he realises, BAM! He's done it. He has literally figured out how to time travel. Likewise, the attempts of Ant-Man, Cap and the Hulk to invent time travel are mostly played for laughs. They have no real consequences in the story. Instead. They derive the tension and the stakes from conflicts between Tony and Steve, as well as Tony wanting to hold on to what he has found in the five years since the snap, and come to see as the most important thing. Family. And to look a little deeper into the scene where Tony discovers time travel, all of the emotional weight and most of the dialogue in the scene is based around whether he should use time travel to save the world if it could risk losing his family. 
The moments between him and Pepper and where his daughter learns to swear are touching and the focus is given to them for a very particular reason, to invest the audience in something more down to earth than the fate of everything and everyone and their cats for all of time. And the scene where Steve finally asks for Tony's help, the conflict is over whether they should pursue this as a second chance. Hence when Cap says, we've got a second chance, Tony picks up his daughter and says, I've got my second chance right here. It's totally believable that Tony wouldn't want to involve himself when he risks losing his daughter. The writers understood that the stakes of saving the world, i.e. bringing everyone back, are difficult for people to really visualize or feel to empathize with, especially given we have outside knowledge that they will succeed because yeah. So instead they chose to scale the story down and ground it in stakes that we can empathize with and that can be realistically lost in the story in spite of the heroes winning the day. And the second way they build tension in the first act is with relationships. So the MCU has spent a decade building up relationships that audiences care about and the risk of losing those character dynamics matter. One part of this is Tony and Steve. It took a long time for Stark and Rogers to respect one another, to develop this dynamic of mutual trust and respect in spite of their philosophical and moral differences. This relationship has always been a tenuous one, growing in Avengers, being challenged in Age of Ultron, heightening in Civil War, and turning to bitterness in Infinity War. It hurts when we see Tony rail at Steve for his failure in the opening. You said we'd win or lose together, and guess what Cap, we lost. I've got Nothing for you, Cap. Nothing. Here, Steve has nothing to say in response. Tony doesn't trust him, and Steve almost doesn't trust himself. The audience cares about this conflict between them being resolved, about this relationship. And because of this, there's tension when he gets angry at Steve. There's tension when Tony refuses to help him. Asking Tony means Steve needs to swallow his pride and Tony would have to trust Steve in his plan again. It feels like that relationship is gone and these are still stakes, ones that we still care about. Another part of this is Natasha and Clint who have always relied on each other and had this strange camaraderie as the two without powers in the Avengers. In the opening scene, we lose that dynamic we cared about when Clint's wife and children are dusted. He withdraws from his friends and those who love and support him. And Natasha spends a significant part of the first act trying to find him. We care about keeping them all together. We care about maintaining these important relationships that they've built up. Because ultimately, the story isn't just about who they lost to Thanos, but what each of them lost in themselves because of it. Hope, optimism and clear moral direction, a normal life. All of these give emotional stakes to the story, because even if in the shadow of a save the world threat, we still care about Tony trusting Steve, about Clint being able to confide in Natasha, about keeping this team together. At no point is the viewer really led to believe that our heroes won't be able to invent time travel, but we are led to believe that Clint won't reconnect, that Tony won't trust Steve again, and that there is risk of Tony losing the daughter he loves. And even if the save the world threat frames the direction of the story overall, the stakes come from Tony's relatable losses and the tension comes from whether we will lose or regain these relationships that we have come to care about. And this focus on building tension through internal character struggles and who will die becomes clearest in the second act, from when they travel back in time through to when Banner uses the Stark Gauntlet. The practical obstacles to saving the world at this point in the story are very simple. Cap has to get the Mind Stone, Tony the Space Stone, Hulk the Time Stone, Nebula and Rhodes the Power Stone, Thor and Rock the Reality Stone, and Clint and Natasha the Soul Stone. But Let's take a closer look at how the tension is built in each of these story threads as they overcome each of these obstacles. In the case of the Power Stone and the Mind Stone, there are no serious obstacles to getting the stones and furthering their saving of the world. Rhodes and Nebula pretty much just walk in and take it. There's even something of a joke in the film where Rhodes says, don't walk in, there's always traps, which Nebula scoffs at, as if the writers were recognizing that usually at this moment in the story, there are pointless obstacles the heroes have to overcome, and they just take it. And in the case of Cap, there is an active subversion of tension by setting up the lift scene from Winter Soldier. So the original scene from Winter Soldier was truly tense, with real stakes, and we can feel how close Cap comes to failing, but in Endgame, the story just sidesteps the tension here entirely, and Cap tricks them into giving him the stone. He then has to fight himself, but it's mostly played for jokes about America's ass. And that's because the focus is really on his character. Both of Cap's moments here, though largely tensionless, brilliantly display his growth. 
He's smarter than before and faster on his feet with the Hail Hydra moment, and he's able to defeat his past self by playing into his own emotional weaknesses with saying Bucky is alive. Much of this is played as a joke, but it's an effective means of showing substantial character growth. In the case of the Space Stone, even though they lose it at the start and are forced to travel further back to the 1970s to find it again, Tony pretty much just walks in and takes it from the vault. But there is tension in this scene, it just doesn't come from difficulties in acquiring the stone. Firstly, Steve has to choose to trust Tony again, which he does. You trust me. I do. Marking a mending of that relationship that we care about. And secondly, Tony has to confront his complex feelings about his father, as well as his own responsibilities of being a father when he meets his dad. And thirdly, Steve has to once again leave Peggy behind a character struggle that would culminate in his choice at the end of the film. These are character struggles that they've developed in previous films. And this pattern becomes even more overt in the case of the Reality Stone. We don't even see Rocket get the stone, he just walks in and takes it from Padme. But once again, there is tension and stakes in this scene. Thor nearly suffers a panic attack and he has to learn to deal with his fears of Thanos and his grief and seeing his home and family, all of whom he has lost in his timeline. He manages to overcome this after meeting with his mother, and all of this culminates in him rediscovering himself as still worthy and still brave, taking back Mjolnir, by which time Rocket arrives with the stone. Once again, none of the tension in this scene is derived from difficulties in getting the stone and being one step closer to saving the world. Those things just happen in the background amidst character struggles. And speaking of Thor, Red? Guys, Thor is my favorite Avenger. So Endgame physically hurt me to watch. I'm convinced the Russos hated everything Taika Waititi did with Thor and Ragnarok, and they decided Endgame was going to be their revenge. Every piece of character development he got in Ragnarok is systematically undone in Infinity War and Endgame. He lost the hair, the cape, the eye, the hammer, learned to be true to himself, embrace his own power, and step up to lead his people. Nope! Now he's a biclops with long hair and a cool weapon again, plus zero sense of responsibility for his people that now need his leadership more than ever. And while every other Avenger is processing their emotions and trauma with a level of excruciating realism that borders on tortuous, Thor is fat now! Isn't that hilarious? Thor doesn't have a single emotional moment in this movie that isn't played for laughs. He has breakdowns, PTSD, anxiety attacks, all things that are played completely straight when Tony suffers from them in Iron Man 3, by the way. He's lost everything that mattered to him, he failed to kill Thanos when it mattered the most, and because of that, trillions of deaths are weighing on his conscience. Clearly, the best way to explore his tortured psyche is to strap on the world's fakest beer gut and have his closest friends dismiss and roll their eyes at his obviously deteriorating psyche. Because haha, -ha, fat people are hilarious. Ha ha, panic attacks are hilarious. Ha ha, crippling depression is hilarious. <sighs> I'm gonna go rewatch Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, a show that likes Thor exactly as much as I do. Right on red, but the Time Stone. The Time Stone is the only story thread that spends time on obstacles explicitly about attaining the stone and not to do with internal character struggles or character deaths. The Hulk has to convince the Ancient One to give him the Time Stone. But there is a reason for this. This is kind of the obligatory exposition scene where they explain how time travel works and to remind the audience that Doctor Strange had a specific plan. And lastly, the Soul Stone. This scene was intentionally placed at the climax of the second act, as the story reaches a new peak in both tension and stakes. This is because the Soul Stone brings with it a grim inevitability, with the audience and characters knowing that one of them has to die to acquire it. There's a dramatic irony to the scene given that the audience saw how Thanos acquired it beforehand. Here, the writers and characters spend no time dealing with whether or not one of them can or should kill themselves to acquire the stone, because the audience already knows on some level that one of them will. The only question is, and this is what they derive the tension from, who will do it? Clint or Natasha? The stakes are high either way. This is why the scene where the two repeatedly try to sacrifice themselves for each other works so well. The tension ramps up because we don't know who will succeed, and we want neither of them to die, each of them getting closer and closer to death till Natasha gets the upper hand and ends her life for Clint. The emotional weight of this scene is also why the story spends more time on Vormir than on most of the other stones. The collection of the Infinity Stones, which takes up the majority of the second act, work despite the audience knowing that they will succeed in doing so, that they will get all the stones. This is because the tension focuses on unknowns and relatable story threads, 
overcoming character struggles like Thor, mending relationships like between Tony and Cap, or over who will die in pursuit of saving the world like with Clint and Natasha. The audience can relate to these internal and external conflicts more, thus becoming more invested, and they cannot predict their outcome, sustaining tension and takes on a level independent of saving the world. So I had to applaud them for that, and there I was, watching our heroes save the world and bring everyone back. It was a fantastic end. Hey, what? We're only two hours into Endgame. Oh, Thanos transported himself to the future with a plan to play God again. Ha ha ha. And speaking of Thanos, I want to talk about how his characterization comes into play. At face value, he behaves wildly inconsistently, seeming cold and self-confident in Infinity War, but slipping into bouts of remarkable sadism towards his enemies and his, big air quotes, family in that movie and in Endgame. I reconcile this by reading him first and foremost as a vindictive narcissist. Here's what I mean. Thanos had an idea, everyone disagreed because it's a stupid ass idea, and now that they're all dead, he tours the universe enacting his will onto others through violence. When he's in control of a situation, as he is for much of Infinity War, he's self-righteous and remarkably calm, but whenever he feels threatened or irritated, he becomes extremely vengeful and, in Endgame, bent on wiping out all life just to settle a score. Each movie shows a different side of Thanos, but both of these characterizations fit completely into his persona of a raging narcissist. The neat thing is that Thanos also serves as a direct foil for the faults of our big three. He has Steve's stubborn conviction but lacks any moral compass to ground it, he has Tony's grand egoism but lacks his ingenuity to back it up, and he has Thor's love of a good fight without the priorities of a worthy king to justify it. And he sees other people as a means to an end and probably couldn't even pronounce the word team. He's the total philosophical antithesis of the Avengers with all of their faults and none of their strengths. Going in blinds to take on the Avengers, and doing so without acquiring the stones first was an act of total hubris, but it's completely on par for Mr. I am inevitable. It's a bold strategy, so let's see how it pays off. So we're in the third act, we're in the end game now, and the story is in unknown territory, and even though the stakes of the Save the World thread are supposedly raised, Thanos now plans to wipe out all of the universe and remake it in his image, which you know, to be fair, in a weird, twisted, philosophical sense, it is still balanced. This pattern of relying on internal conflicts and character deaths for tension and stakes translates to the third act as well. However, as the final act of not just the film, but really the end game to everything the MCU has built so far, the emphasis shifts to character deaths, and how they do this is actually really interesting. If kind of an obscure meta discussion on how we perceive fiction. There's this weird trope in fiction, which you might recognize, where characters can't die, or we don't expect them to, until their character arc is resolved. Like there's this internal logic that the oven of fate isn't done baking them yet. It's not uncommon to have a scene that finally bring this character's arc to its close just before they die. Maybe they reconcile with another character, they prove they've got over their fears, or they overcome a fatal character flaw, and sometimes the death equals redemption trope kicks in, like how Boromir's arc ends in redemption by him dying defending the hobbits. This is why it's kind of shocking when some characters die before we feel their story is done, whatever that means. But the flip side of this is that seeing a character's arc concluded means that it puts them in the danger zone in our minds, and our six main characters in Endgame measure up pretty well against this. Thor redeems himself by facing up to his failure and fighting Thanos once more, he is, as his mother told him, being his best at who he is. Worthy. His character arc is brought to a satisfying point. Steve Rogers' arc culminates in him being proved as worthy to wield Mjolnir. That through every trial and tribulation, he maintained his moral character, and undid his failures in Infinity War. He also now trusts and mends his relationship with Tony. This is a good end to his arc. Banner's arc culminated with his own snap to revive half the universe. In the start of the MCU, Banner saw the Hulk as a destructive monster. But now that the Hulk and Banner can work together as a team, he is able to use his strength to create, rather than senselessly destroy. It's not by becoming Professor Hulk, but by doing his own snap that Banner truly realizes he isn't a monster anymore. Clint, while well, laying down his life to save his family from Thanos would be the ultimate redemption for all he has done, which we see he struggles with. And Tony? Tony's arc is the most poignant here of all. He has finally come to see that family is the most important thing, manifested in this moment where he hugs Peter Parker close, the natural reaction to the scene from Homecoming. That's not a hug, I'm just grabbing the door for you. We're not, we're not there yet. He has also redeemed himself by bringing the boy he felt responsible for back. 
On top of this, in the original Avengers film, there's this tense interaction between Tony and Cap. You're not the guy to make the sacrifice play? To lay down on a wire and let the other guy crawl over you? I think I would just cut the wire. Here, Tony finally becomes selfless as he lays down his life. His arc is finished. In a strange meta sense, the resolution of these six character arcs puts an expectation that any or all of these characters could die. They were all in the danger zone in that final battle against Thanos. There isn't that feeling of unfinished business for them that often means the audiences discount danger towards a particular character. No one really thought that Thor was going to die in Thor 2. If any one of them would have been the one to click their fingers like Tony did, it would have been a satisfying end. The result of all of this is a save the world story that still feels tense because the weight is on character rather than plot. Thanks so much for having us here, man. It was great to stop by and dish about Endgame. If you want to see more from us, head to Overly Sarcastic Productions and check out our Trope Talks playlist for more fun literary analysis. Now, if you'll excuse us, we gotta get back home before the timeline splits into a dozen fragments. Oh, totally understand. Fed the timeline and multiverse and all, I've got my own dimension to take care of. Thought full of you, haha, <laughs> to chime in, and sorry to put a cap on this discussion, but it was inevitable. Uh, I'm, I'm terrible. But that is all from us. Hope you guys enjoyed this collaboration. I really love working with OSP. They're fantastic, both of them, and go check them out. As always, come follow me over on Twitter and Instagram. That's actually where I live stream, do just some casual chats, and you can ask me questions and so on. Support the channel over on Patreon. Get my book down at the link in the description below. Thank you to the literal 800 of you who already have. Truly means the world. You guys are fantastic. I love you all. Stay nerdy, and thank you to all my patrons. I will see you in the future.